Hello and welcome to my six-day Christmas special series of Silence, a podcast that gives women in science, technology, engineering and maths, or STEM, an opportunity to be honest and open about what it's really like surviving and thriving in an often male-dominated world. I've reached the half-year mark, which means that each week for the past 26 weeks, an incredible woman in STEM has shared her stories and experiences. She may have been a public figure, the girl next door, or someone from a far-off land. What's special about silence is that all my guests have been deliberately kept anonymous and disguised to ensure that we're not distracted or even intimidated by her achievements or what she looks like. I'm Dr. Shanice O'Mara, also a woman in STEM. I studied mechanical engineering and ended up as a television broadcaster. Through my work reporting on some cutting edge technology and innovation over the years, I've met some incredible females from a diverse range of STEM fields, and some of them have been brave and kind enough to share their personal stories with me on this show. These women have been doing groundbreaking work within the world of STEM, but what has been most impressive and inspiring for me is learning about their human side. Here are some of the best sound bites from across the first 13 episodes. It gets raw, upfront and transparent, and I hope what you hear in the next half an hour over the next six days resonates with you too. If so, please do subscribe to Silence and maybe even leave some comments and reviews. I'd love to have your feedback. Enjoy. Now, sometimes I see situations where it does seem like we we are having to work really hard to prove ourselves. But on the other hand, I've definitely also observed women in situations where I feel like they are putting undue pressure on themselves to do that with the the idea that somehow it's required but I can't find the evidence that it is. I think if there's a solution, I definitely haven't found it yet. Um, I know there's some magical balance between work, school, and a social life, but I have not found that yet. And my kind of thinking in that is that I have school to get through, and once I'm done with graduate school, once I've gotten my PhD, then I'll have time to get back into the hobbies that I love, get back into having a social life. And I'm worried that by then, then maybe I've already destroyed my social life or lost the friendships or forgotten how to do the hobbies that I used to do. Um, So I still have not found a solution for that. still have all this, um, I guess it's just this thinking that, well, this is just how it's going to be in college. This is like, there's not really any way around it. So it's definitely been hard. Um, with that kind of mindset. There there are ways within the industry where you can have a more balanced lifestyle. I don't really think that's possible in the commercial sector. So if you're working for a big company and you're trying to climb up some corporate ladder, as with any industry, you know, you you have to commit, you have to make compromises with other things you want to do in order to get to those higher roles. And I think that's the reason why possibly you see less women in those roles, because it's a huge um, compromise to get there and it generally means perhaps not having a family or if you do have a family then you don't perhaps have a lot of time to dedicate to your family. We can't, no one can have it all. There's always a cost and I think that our society would be better off if we had equal representation of women and men in all fields um, just because you know we talk about diversity and perspectives and there's a lot of research now that shows that diverse teams produce better work and better bottom lines for companies um, And part of diversity is just having people with different perspectives. That includes women and includes all kinds of different people. So I I see progress. I think there is progress. I think that anyone who feels threatened by the entry of new people, no matter what, into their field is going to fight. And so I think as we're seeing globally and internationally, as we're seeing percentages tip in different ways, we are seeing the very ugly side of people um, fighting for what they think is is their right or their position or the competition. It's the finding it difficult that makes it in the end quite rewarding. Anything you have to really work hard for, when you do finally get there, it's so much more of a wonderful feeling that you've overcome difficulty or you've bettered yourself in some way, you've surprised yourself in some way that gosh, you thought you couldn't do it. There's someone that 
client once said to me, it's quite often that we're undermining ourselves and, you know, we think we can't do something when actually we can. When we find it difficult, it's, I remind myself of that. I say, not that this is impossible. I'm just telling myself that I can't do this. I just have to have some belief that I can pull through this. And there were many moments like that. It never goes away, the need to figure out how to balance your needs as a person. And honestly, I think a lot of growing up and a lot of going through school, whatever it may be, is figuring out what are my priorities? What are my needs? How can I balance those needs? Uh, because we all need to have a certain level of, of social life. We all want to be able to have family, whether that means having children or not. Uh, and especially in the culture that we have here in my country, um, there is a huge obsession with work and working honestly unhealthy amounts. And so I think we all need to have a lot of conversations about what what balance looks like and what having it all looks like. And I think, um, especially for women trying to pursue difficult career subjects, being in a situation where you have a, a supportive network around you is extremely important, whether that's your spouse, your partner, um, your, your parents, your circle of friends. Uh, we all need to have some kind of support to help us take care of ourselves as well as the people we love. We all at some point will go through that, you know, at some point in your career, you'd ask yourself, am I good enough? Do I deserve to be here? How did I get here? Do you know, I was actually speaking to a friend a couple of um, days ago and we talked about imposter syndrome and how um, when we were doing our PhDs, we, we were always thinking, oh my God, I hope I don't get found out. You know, do I deserve to be here? Um, did they make a mistake? <laughs> you know, and for me, I realized after some time that, you know what, the, you know, I had a panel of about 12 people interview me for my PhD um, studentship and 12 people cannot be wrong. You know, I had to, you know, accept that, you know what, you deserve to be here as much as everybody else. Get your head down, focus and do the work and, you know, let your work speak for itself, you know. But then again, it's, I think it's, our, maybe it's our upbringing, maybe it's it's our background, maybe it's um, the cultural um, aspect of it as well. Um, it could be, it could be so many factors, but at some point you have to just take a, take a hold of your life and just be responsible for it. You know, that might take longer for others, uh, you know, that might take a longer time for some than others, but I feel like everyone goes through that at some point, you know, everybody will, will doubt themselves. <laughs> or I think it's probably, sometimes it's good because if you think you'll actually, uh, if you're arrogant about actually, I deserve to be here, I'm God's, God's gift to science, then actually maybe there's something wrong there. I had no idea. I really didn't know what I was going to be, what I was interested in, but I had a, like this, I think it started with a strength in math and liking puzzles and then being encouraged by my teachers and my parents. Knowing what I wanted to do was what got me through. Knowing that I wanted to work on something to do with the space industry or some kind of engineering. We don't all have to be scientists and engineers, but I want you to get the joy out of it that I have. Like, Well, I went into college because like that's what my family expected me to do. But like when I was there, I completely had no idea what was going on. And I was a terrible student, you know, and then when I came back, I was there for myself. And that's where I knew I wanted to be. And that's, I was where I wanted to be, you know, and that's why I'm working so hard now to get to where I want to be because I know like within me, like it is a solid foundation for everything else that this is exactly what I should be doing and where I want to be. Just have the belief that you are actually capable of doing it. It's not all geniuses that are out here doing STEM. It's everybody. Before there were, you know, professions, scientists were just people that tinkered in their backyards. You know, when something somebody else wants it for you, like, I don't think it has the same meaning. I don't know. You know, I think it has to be something that you want for yourself. So I know everyone has a different definition of having it all. But for me, it's being able to do something I'm passionate about and that I feel is making a difference and contributing to improving the lives of others. Being able to have meaningful and interesting relationships with friends and family. 
and just being able to have balance where I can devote time to things and people that make me happy. Like that to me is having it all. Like if I have a great career and a great support network and have some hobbies that I love, like I'm set. That to me is having it all. And what about like in the romance department and having a family and things like, do you have uh, children? Do you want to? How does that fit into the equation? So I feel like if it happened and I met the right person, absolutely, I would be open to it. I could go either way. Um, And I've had relationships throughout my career, which I feel like has only enhanced it, like provided those positive experiences. I do know that when I've seen women in previous jobs who've had kids, it's it's tough. Like with the gender imbalance, you do see the women take the weeks or the months out of the office, whereas the man usually doesn't. Um, so I have noticed that as my only gender imbalance. But I feel like for me, um, having it all doesn't necessarily mean I have to have kids or anything. I'd be if I met someone that you know I really connected with and we both wanted that, I'd absolutely be open to it. I think for me, I just want it to be the right decision, um, not to do it just to do it. Personally, I was diagnosed with depression for the first time after my freshman year of college. And that was really a point where I started realizing the need to take care of myself and my own needs and not simply to focus on all of the external things that were going on whether that was um, commitments that I'd made to various groups or trying to get the highest grades that I could get. Uh, And sadly for me, um, depression is a problem that, that crops up from time to time in my life. And it typically crops up at times when I haven't been good at balancing what I'm doing for others and what I'm doing for myself. And so at least Personally, I think we should always be thinking about this because at some point you focus on things outside of yourself, say, or, or you know, focus on, on things like your grades to an extent that you build up kind of a deficit of self-care that you needed to provide to yourself and you'll get burnt out and you'll, you'll you know, things just kind of fall apart at some point. And at that point, it's all kind of shot. And ideally, you don't get to that point of being burned out if you take care of yourself. And if you really do try to think about what are the things that I need. Um, and what you need goes beyond sleeping, eating, and doing your academic work. Men tend to dominate the sort of more senior roles. But I think that's, you know, for other issues, largely to do with the natural sort of cycle of women's life, you know, going away to have kids or, you know, sort of pursue more of a family life. If I was in a um, situation where I was supporting a family myself, I'm not so sure I'd choose this particular type of job. I would maybe have to seek something else within the industry because, unfortunately, you have to put in a lot of hours. And I don't think anyone, not many people do this job for pay. There are ways, I'm sure, to make more money in general practice or, you know, when you specialise, you do it for the pure love of it. And we're lucky enough to get paid for it. But But, um, you know, if I was having to support a family on my own, there would probably be more economical ways of doing that within this industry. I'd have to be a bit clever about it. You know, so that would actually potentially really change the type of job I do. Yeah, I feel like you just really have to follow your heart. And it shows in your work and your enthusiasm, like when you're doing something you love and that you want to do. I feel like it doesn't help anyone if like someone's there and they don't want to be there, right? Especially for girls, just answering questions and just participating and kind of letting um, your skills and sort of intellectual capacity be visible is enough to immediately differentiate you. So in some ways, it's like, well, being myself just meant that I was a nerd. You know, being curious about things or being committed was, was enough. Growing up, actually, my brother was my only role model, (laughs) my eldest brother. So he's a medical doctor, um, and I just literally wanted to be like him growing up until I, you know, got to university, actually, because I wasn't really surrounded by... So I come from a family where my my dad was a teacher, my mom, you know, worked in the medical field as well. So it was quite a, you know, quite an academic family. And I remember my mom used to tell me growing up, your book is your best friend. So I was, you know, I was really encouraged to study and to learn 
Um, I, I remember having encyclopedias growing up and just reading about them and looking at pictures of, you know, random animals and understanding where they live and why they live there. So learning has always been encouraged in my home. So I would say really my mom and my brother, and to a large extent, my dad, um, have been my role models because they really just put that spark in me to want to learn, to want to be aware and to be, and to also, to, and also to believe that if I do the work, I, I will, I will, I will succeed. I was raised in a household where science was definitely the primary lens on the world, but art and music was very much a part of it. And so I think that the the way that I was introduced to science was not this monolithic thing. It was really curiosity. Science was about, oh, that thing is cool. How does it do that? And then investigating it and like, oh, let's try some stuff. Let's see if we can, can we change it? You know, that that I think is the is the blocker is when we talk about science as this monolithic scary sort of black box, it takes away from what most kids I think do naturally, which is inquire about the world around them and how it works. I was given pretty good advice at the time that if you're going to go on to study a subject for three years, you should choose something that you enjoy because, or certainly that you um, are good at because you're going to need that motivation to do independent learning and to read around a subject and to put in the time. I was later on in life um, when I had children um, so it was something I'd liked, you know, I wanted to have, but um, it wasn't that my career was the, the thing that prevented me. It was just um, when I met my husband, you know, the, the opportunities that came my way. Um, but I think when I wanted something, I've always focused on it um, and gone for it and applied myself. So that I suppose part of it has part of the way I've um, shown an interest in something has enabled me to to get to where I am. And I'm just thinking when I was younger, just seeing my mum working hard uh, when my parents divorced, um, she worked really hard to ensure that we did our homework, um, you know, taught to us about the importance of going to on to further education, um, but not to the point where it was if we chose a different pathway, she'd prevent that. But she taught us to also have an open mind and um, to really just accept people for who they are without judgment, really. And I think that's just such an important thing in life, no matter what what work you go into. Um, and I think we sometimes just get so focused on, um, I suppose, being, a, you know, when you ask the question about which path we're going to take and where we should be, um, it's having the opportunity to not almost go down and be the norm and sometimes do something different. And it doesn't matter if things... Um, don't go as you predicted um, it's good to to almost learn from that is is that sometimes it's not always going to go the way you want it to and and that's okay uh, yeah once again a lot of answers I actually just finished reading Brotopia by uh, Emily Chang and that kind of talks about how Silicon Valley became such a Brotopia and basically just the people who founded it, um, instilling their ideas and hiring and only wanting to work with people that um, think like you, look like you, I think is the main problem. Sometimes it's, it is easier just to fit in and go with the flow. Um, I've only very recently started um, pushing back, reminding the team, hey, you guys, let's reconsider my idea again. Um, This is very new. And every time I, I speak out, I, in the back of my head, I'm just thinking like, oh crap, is this, is this the moment where I'm going to get in trouble and I'm going to get fired? Um, (laughs) So uh, yeah, just faking that confidence and pushing through, I guess. And I still had that niggling um, voice in my mind that, look, you know, your plan was always veterinary. Are you going to go back to that? You know, are you abandoning? This is the time to decide. And I'm very lucky I had some great advice from a friend who did a job that he was great at and absolutely loved. And he said, if there's any advice I can give you, it's, it's never too late to make sure you can do a career that you really love. Religion answers the why and science answers the how. And they're separate things and they can emerge, you know, they can exist and emerge in different ways. But I do think that there is a question of integrity for each of us. Nothing we do exists in a vacuum. And I think that's the third piece of it is kind of 
why are you doing it? Yes, great, hedonism, being happy. And I, I think we each do better when we're joyful. And then I just think, I feel that I have a responsibility to help make that possible for others. And so in, in the applied aspect, like you can be a theory, you can be work in theory or you can work in applied science. And theory is really important. It moves things forward as well. But without application, we're not really changing the world. So I, I think for me, it's a balance of indulging in curiosity and the questions, but also then applying that so that others can benefit from um, you know, the good fortune that I've had. That's it for today. Isn't there something so liberating about letting your guard down and speaking your truth? It's not easy being in a minority as a woman in STEM or otherwise, but through this Christmas compilation series of six episodes, I hope you get some inspiration and comfort on how to be your best self and live up to your own fullest potential. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in tomorrow for episode five.